everyone who have HIV and on medication get to live the same lifespan with somebody without HIV if they're on medication. So that is the most important thing about being on medication for HIV treatment. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Your Health Matters. I am Vivian Nachoayok, your host, and today we're going to be talking about living with diabetes and HIV. Since the discovery of HIV in the early 80s as the main cause of AIDS, a lot has happened in our understanding of the virus, how it's transmitted, management, and also how we talk about it, reducing the stigma. With me today to discuss this really important topic is family nurse practitioner Ike Chukunwosu. Ike Chuku, or Ike, if I may call you that, is a family nurse practitioner with over seven years experience in primary care, infectious disease, HIV, AIDS, hepatitis C, and also opioid abuse management. He currently practices at the Family Medical Counseling Services Health Center in Washington, D.C. So, Ike Chiku, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vivian. Thank you for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm excited to get on board to discuss what we have today. Awesome. I remember dealing with one of the nurses at your health center, and we had difficulties with one of the participants in our program, and they were trying to reach their provider. And they're like, oh, we got someone new. Here's the name. I started laughing. I said, there's no way I'm going to talk to this gentleman and not start in Igbo. It's like, Ike Chuku, this, I mean, I don't know anymore how <laughs> much more Igbo <evil laughs> you can get yeah. with a name like that. And there was no like Peter or John to try to break it. And I'm like, this is a proud Igbo man. I better start that conversation with Kedu. I am super grateful you're here. You agreed to do this. So share with our listener a little bit more about you. Why infectious disease? Why primary care? Why DC? All that good stuff. Oh, like I said earlier, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's, a, it's been a journey for me, to be honest. Coming all the way from Nigeria, as you already mentioned, I'm Igbo by tribe. Yeah, so, and it's something that we, the Igbo people, were really proud of. So when I came to the U.S., there was no need of changing my name to English name or using my English name, which is my middle name. i rather keep the first name the way it is. Most people call me Ike, my patients call me Ike, colleagues, because it's easier for them to pronounce. But yeah, my journey into primary care, being in, in the infectious disease world and managing HIV, Hep C, um, I would say it actually started way back when I was in ninth grade, but I didn't know it then. I remember at the time, that was when the education about HIV and AIDS was getting popular in, in Africa. The, Western were bringing it, making people aware of this. So in my school then, I was among the few students that were selected to go to one program there that was held at the time in Kaduna State when I was in school, to go sit for the lectures, get the knowledge, bring it back to our campus and teach our fellow students. Of course, that was the basic HIV AIDS information at the time, which was fascinating to me. Now, fast forward, when I came to the U.S. for my undergraduate studies, I went into nursing school. Now, the funny thing about it is that while I was in school doing my master's, my first ever clinical rotation is part of my journey into where I am today. I was told that I needed a primary care. I had an injury playing soccer. I went to the ER. The first question they asked me is that, who was my primary care? I told them I don't have one. They said, why don't you have one? The African man in me, you know how we do back home. If you're healthy, there's no point going to 
see a doctor or a medical profession. So I said, I'm a healthy young man. And mind you, I was like 20 something at the time. I'm like, I'm a healthy young man. I don't have any need to go see a doctor. There's no, that is false. You need to have your primary care. At least get your physical exam once a year, get your last, make sure everything is okay. I said, oh, okay. So when I got discharged from the ER, I started looking for a primary care location. So I went to this primary care location office here in DC and the person who was attending to me happened to be a nurse practitioner. And during the process of our conversation, she also happened to have graduated from Howard University. Her name is Dr. Elena Mayo Mills. So I finished my physical I told her like, you know what? I think I like your clinic and I'm actually looking for a clinical rotation site. Is it okay if I come here for my clinical rotation? She passed a bid and said she doesn't usually take students because her first experience with students wasn't pretty good. But having the conversation between she and I has been quite good. She thinks I'm capable of handling it, that she will give me a chance. So she gave me a chance. I came to my first ever clinical rotation in my MP program. It went well, went very well. Then I went on to do other things. And fast forward to me finishing the program, doing my board exam and passing my board exam. The first person I called was her. Hey, I finished my exam and I passed. I'm not an MP. Do you have any job at your location? Because I really enjoy my experience in that location. And then she told me that she's no longer there, but where she works, they're actually looking for a provider. Fast forward to my interview, everything went well, I got the job. I started working as a primary care. It was initially supposed to be a primary care role, but what happened is that the clinic also actually known for their HIV management for people in the area, in the DC metropolitan area. And luckily enough, the medical director is very vast in HIV management, Dr. Veronica Jenkins. And she told me, hey, Ike, look, I can teach you about all you need to know about HIV management if you're willing to learn. And for me, I'm always ready to learn. I said, sure, I am willing to learn. And that's how I got on here. Then it also brought me back to my initial story about going to represent my school in HIV studies. That's impressive. From ninth grade, getting exposure to HIV awareness education. Fast forward so many years later, you actually having the opportunity to actually help people who are living with it. So that is really impressive. We're happy you decided to go into nursing and become a nurse practitioner, okay? We need more people like you in DC. And there is something about getting care especially when you're dealing with something like HIV that still has a lot of stigma associated with it, to have someone that look like you, to have someone that comes from your community, right? That can really break it down and help you make sense of what it is, how to deal with the trauma of living with it, and how do you manage moving forward, right? No longer a dead sentence like it used to be, but Before we go into a lot of details, just something we do for the show, we like to really keep it simple and break it down. So I know I've been saying HIV, HIV. Why don't you break it down for our audience? What is HIV? Okay. So to keep it simple, HIV is simply a virus, a type of virus. Now there are so many millions and billions of viruses in in the world. But this particular one is what we'll call human immunodeficiency virus. This virus attacks the cells that help the body to fight infection. So when it attacks the cells in the body, it makes the person more vulnerable to other infections and disease. Simply put, that's what HIV is. So it it breaks the person down at that point when it gets to the person's body. All right. And how's that different from AIDS? Because a lot of time people will say HIV, you hear HIV, they automatically think AIDS. So how is HIV diagnosis different from a diagnosis of AIDS? So to answer that, HIV, which is a virus, once it gets into the body, if it's not treated, and that's when if it's not recognized, the person doesn't know that they have HIV and there's not treated, no medication, which we'll get into as we go along the virus keep breaking down the body until it get to what we call the stage three of the HIV infection. That's where it become AIDS. 
and ACE by definition is called acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So that becomes the disease itself, where at this point, it has badly damaged the person's immune system to the point where the person has become sick. Now, there are certain numbers we look at why before we can diagnose the person to have AIDS. One is that we're looking at what we call CD4 cell counts. These are those immune systems that help the body to fight infections. So the HIV has attacked it, where to the point it gets to the level of 200 cells per cubic millimeter. So it's like when they get to the lab, they measure how many of those cells is remaining. For a normal person with an HIV infection, it's supposed to be from like 500 to about 1,500. Now with HIV infection not treated, it gets below 200. And when it gets to this level, it becomes a critical level where the person is prone to infection. So in summary, the HIV is a virus itself which infects the person. The AIDS is when there's no treatment and the person, the immune system is severely damaged. And now, another important thing to know is that someone can have HIV infection without having AIDS, you know, and that's where the treatment comes in place. So as long as on your treatment and you're taking it and the medication is working, you may never have AIDS. The HIV infection never kills anybody. And once you get to AIDS without treatment, you have approximately three years unless you get on treatment, which is why it's important to get on medication as soon as possible when diagnosed with HIV infection. That's a really good point you make there. So even with the AIDS, it's not necessarily the AIDS that's killing you. It's the infection Correct. that you acquire and everything else that actually kills, not necessarily just having the diagnosis. And by having the diagnosis doesn't mean, oh, that's the end of my life. You can have that diagnosis AIDS and get on treatment and everything you will see now begin to live a normal life. Before we get into treatment options, what about transmission? The main means of transmission is still through sexual intercourse, am I correct? Correct. The, the primary mode of transmission through is sexual intercourse, sexual intercourse, unprotected sexual intercourse. And the unprotected um, could be with a condom, which is a barrier method. That's when it was unprotected. Of course, you now have the needle sharing, which is more common in the drug users, people who do drugs like cocaine, all kinds of opioid, heroin, and all that. You also have another mode, which is prenatal transmission, which where a pregnant woman can travel from a pregnant woman who is HIV positive to the fetus or during childbirth or during breastfeeding. But with the provision of medications now, that chance has decreased to less than 1%, especially in the U.S. You also have the issue of blood transfusion, which also in the U.S., that is pretty much not to zero because of the processes involved in screening every blood that is used in blood transfusion into your snack. That can be saved to other developing countries. So that risk is still in that. Correct. Let's look at education when it comes to deal with HIV. I, when I was growing up, the thing that had to do with sex was a taboo. As the daughter of an evil man, the first daughter, as a matter of fact, there was a lot. There was, let me just put it this way. There was like zero education. It was like, it's a non-starter. And pretty much the message was, if you really want to experience the wrath of God, come to this house pregnant, let alone <laughs> with HIV, you know what I mean? So that was the education around sex. Oh, it was none, pretty much. They did their best, but it right. wasn't something from a cultural perspective that was openly discussed. I don't think any of my friends in college at the time, boarding school, ever came back and said, oh, I had this talk with my mom and she told me about safe sex. That did not happen. Okay, so how are we able to talk about it, increase awareness in our community so that we as parents now, the next generation, are not putting out false information and we probably have the youth much better prepared to understanding what this infection is and how to better take care of themselves. So around the prevention of increasing awareness, what has education looked like and what has been successful? You're right about that in terms of the sexual education in the household. 
even here in the US, I come across patients who say the same thing. It's something that was never discussed at home. It's something that some people are shy to discuss with their kids. And it's something that is not an easy topic to discuss, especially between the age gap between parents and because of the age gap between the parents and the children. But it's something that needs to be done, given the prevalence of HIV in the community at the moment, especially in a situation where we know that they're becoming a different gender roles or sexual classification and use. The gay community, men who have sex with men, transgender, of course, heterosexual men and women. So it's becoming a time where we need to educate about safe sex because statistics show that with the transmission of HIV through sex, it is more common among men who have sex with men. There's lack of use of condom. What you have come to see is that for this group, it will be the assumption that there is no going to be a pregnancy involved. So what is the point of using condom? The lack of education where, because it's true and of sex, there is this false knowledge that you cannot catch STD in that route, right? But come to think about it, it is not true because the mucosa area, which is the skin area in the anal, is actually very, very thin and very prone to breakage, micro breaks in there. And that allows easy, quicker and easier transmission of HIV. So that's where education comes in. No matter what sexual preference a person has, you want to push through the condom use. And not just condom use, proper and consistent condom use is the key. You can't just use it one minute and take it off. You can't just say, oh, let me use dry the first sex period and maybe take it off when you're about to ejaculate. Because these are stories we hear, you understand? Or so say, let's, just, uh, let's not use it at the beginning. And also talking about sexual education, I want to also talk about having one partner, if possible. Of course, in this day and age, it's something that might not be easy and common. So you preach abstinence, if possible. Uh, preach one sexual partner, if possible. When it's not possible, preach consistent and pr proper condom use. I will use the word preach. For those who are not, at times when you use preach, it seems like you're becoming religious. And that's not what it's supposed to be. It's encourage, educate, teach. That's what we do with that. Always use a condom, always use a condom. You can not say it enough. That has gone a long way in helping with the sexual orientation and education. And another thing too, what about when you're having new partners, checking your status? I think that's something that can be a little uncomfortable in our community. You can't say, ah, I took this girl for lunch or we went out, had a wonderful date. And then the next question is, what's your HIV status? That would make for a very uncomfortable dinner conversation. <laughs> So, That's true. But it's necessary, wouldn't you say? At some point before people really move to that next level in relationship, when they decide to become intimate, that it is really important to make sure you know your status and that of your future partner. What do you tell people about, hey, you got to know your status and that of your partner as well? And how often should people be checking? So yes, you're right. It, it's uh, something that can be awkward when, you know, a date, but it's something that is important. And that comes to the number of sexual partners you're having. You want to discuss those things in the safest and respectable way as possible. Testing is a key. It's one of the prevention. As a matter of fact, it's number one prevention method of HIV infection before even come to using condom and all that. Because when you know your status, you know that you can get medication and which we also will talk about. We also know that, okay, I can be reckless with my sexual behavior. So that limits the transmission to other people. Having to talk about testing is very important. It's recommended that people should test at least once a year. And these are for people who you know that you're not involved in a high-risk sexual behavior. You haven't been exposed to anything like 
needle stick uh, work that could lead to HIV infection. So once a year is recommended, but it's also recommended that if you're gonna be having multiple partners, if you're changing partners, you and your partner should discuss about getting tested, even if it's together or differently. But whenever you change your partner and you're gonna be sexually active with your partner, you should both know your status, right? If you're having multiple sexual partners, you should also know your status. Because we're in a world where, like you said, you don't know what people are doing. They might have more than one partner. They might not disclose that. So you and the partner should be able to get tested as soon as possible. Now, in, what, in that relationship, it's also recommended to get tested at least three to six months, if possible, as long as you're sexually active, you're not using condom, and none of you know your, each, know each other sexual history. You should text as frequent as possible and also engage in condom use as much as possible. And another thing too, you mentioned medication as part of prevention strategy. Talk a little bit more about what options people have now and how they can get access. The first one is the, for someone who already have HIV to get on medication, right? Correct. You have so many medication they can get on. And by getting on medication, what that does is it lowers the viral load to what we call undetected viral load. This is the number of the virus in the system that can be detected in the lab. The medication, which is antiretroviral therapy, which are many of them, will help kill these viruses to the point where it's not detected. And when it's not detected, the chances of transmitting to another person is zero to almost zero percent. What we call U equals U in our field. So it means undetectable equals to untransmitted. So that's number one way of preventing HIV transmission. Now, the other one is what we call PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. This medication we give to clients who, one, if they have HIV positive partner, but want to continue the relationship and be sexually active in the relationship, we provide these medications to them and as long as they're taking it every single day, yeah. they are, have 90, over 90% 90 chance of not getting HIV infection, even if their partner is not undetected. Now, when their partner is undetected and they're also, and the one who is negative is on PrEP, then the chances is equally zero. As long as both sides are doing what they're supposed to do, partner taking their own medication and the other person taking their PrEP. Now, the question will come, oh, what if I just take the medication when I'm about to have sex? No, that is not advisable. It's not good. Research, current research haven't established any guarantee prevention of HIV infection. Or oh, what if I take it after I have sex? No, you have to get on this medication. You have to take it every single day, as long as you're still engaging in unprotected access with your partner. Or oh, it's not just for someone who has HIV person, or someone who's gonna be having multiple partner who doesn't have ability to ask for HIV status of their partner. And most importantly for those men or for those who have sex workers, they also are very high risk of HIV transmission or getting an infection. So as long as we recommend it to them, they're taking it, that prevents, lowers the risk of getting HIV infection. People who use drugs, I also recommend it to them. And someone who thinks that they're going to have a new partner, they don't want to have the conversation, but they want to be having a particular sex, we also recommend the prep to them. You bring some really good points, and I really want us to make sure everyone understands some really key things you said there. So in summary, you said, one, if someone is going to be engaging in sexual activities, they don't know the status of their partner, and they want prep, they should be able to get it. Am I correct? Yes. So you cannot take this the night before and be like, that provides you protection or the morning after one pill, right? It has to be right. consistently taking this medication on a regular basis. Correct. And even when you start PrEP, you can't just say you go into the clinic today, we want to start PrEP. Of course, before the statute, they want to make sure you're not HIV positive first. So once all that clear, make sure your kidney is working good, but that's clear, the statute on PrEP. You take that pill today. You don't go and say, oh, okay, now I'm free. I can have sexual activity in the node. 
because it, it actually takes approximately 20 days before you start having that effect of protection from the PrEP medication. You talk, we're talking about prevention. You mentioned the role of medication as part of prevention strategy. We talk about knowing your status. We talked also about needle sharing and all those other really important things. But let's switch now and talk about treatment here. We know medications have been a really game changer for people who've been diagnosed with HIV, right? It's really helped people live longer, prevent them from actually developing AIDS. We now know that females on medication and being monitored and doing everything right can really have safe pregnancies, can really have healthy babies without the infection. We also know that men can go on to have healthy relationship, whether depending on the partner and even go on to have families. So many wonderful things have happened. People are living longer now just because of the benefit of having antiretroviral therapy. So talk a little bit about some of the benefits of having antiretroviral therapy. One of the super benefits is getting on medication early, staying on the medication consistently, not only preserve your quality of life, you also prevent transmission and spread of the disease infection to other people. So that is the reason if you see from when HIV came into existence to now, there have been a steady decline in HIV diagnosis. It's not because a lot of people are not being tested. People are still being tested, but it's because a lot of people are now on medication and that has decreased the chance of spreading the virus. That came to what I mentioned earlier, U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable. So when you get on medication, it brings your viral load down or the person viral load down, and then the chance of transmitting to another person is non to zero. The goal um, from the World Health Organization is what we we'll call 90-90-90 rules. Is the well, 90% of the people who know their status and the 90% of the people who are positive will get into care and start medication. And the 90% of the people who are medication will be undetected. So that's what we're all working across in all around the world to achieve that goal. The data is not yet out. It was a goal set to be achieved by 2020 because the data is not out if that has happened already but we're looking forward to having positive results on that. So that's where the getting on medication is very important. Um, getting on medication, like we said earlier, prevent the person from acquiring AIDS. So by taking the medication every day, of course now we'll have new developments of medication where you actually have injection once every month or once every other month, depending on the person. So with that being said, that prevents the transmission of the infection and keep your quality of life. Everyone who have HIV and on medication get to live the same lifespan with somebody without HIV, if they're on medication. So that is the most important thing about being on medication for HIV treatment management. That's, that's a really good news. And I think it's worth repeating again, because I know that there are still people who face that stigma. There is that fear, there is the trauma when people have that diagnosis, they think all is lost. Can you also talk about depression and other health conditions? My question I'm trying to ask you screen for depression as well, for people who come in and they get a diagnosis um, of HIV infection. How do you manage that? You just, hey, provide treatment and it, or do you also have supportive services as well of how people can handle this, how they're able to share that information with their partners, how they're able to live their life. What other kind of um, support is available for a person who gets told they have HIV? That's a good question. HIV carries a lot of stigma, big, big stigma in our society. And this because of uh, the onset when HIV came into play, when nobody knew what it is, Nobody know how to manage it. A lot of people were dying. And it was at the time that you only get it from having sex. It was a more is a disease of gay men or gay people or lesbian. That carried a lot of stigma. But in the world where we live now, we're doing all we can to let people know this is not a disease or infection of somebody being at fault. 
This is not infection that will lead to demise of the person. This is not infection that should bring shame to the person. Anybody can have it. The best of us all can have it. And now, of course, it's easier said than done. So when somebody walks into your office, to the clinic, and get that lab done, and you break it down that this is what you have, that feeling of hopelessness, there is that feeling of anger, there's that feeling of loss of sense of self, and there's a lot of emotion going through, and that also comes with depression. Some people have PTSD from that. So that comes with where, as primary care providers, as HIV management providers, there are so many services available. We have to screen for depression every visit that you come in to make sure that you're still okay. Even if when you're on medication, even if you've been on this treatment for years, we still have to screen for depression every single visit that you come in. And we have resources for we have psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers available to render mental health care services to our clients. With that also comes with nutrition issues. So we have nutrition available. Nutrition is available to render nutrition counseling and also services point them to the direction of getting free, adequate, proper nutrition for the client. So there are so many, like to answer that, there are so many resources available, most importantly, for mental health to cater for the patients. And that's one thing I loved about the health center you work at. There's a much more holistic approach to caring for the clients, whether they have HIV or other chronic conditions. You guys do a really amazing, amazing job caring for them. So we've talked about antiretroviral therapy. Let's talk about the fact that, yes, now this medications is allowing people to live longer. And with that means now that they're able to also become at risk for other chronic conditions like diabetes. There were a few research articles I was looking at that said because of some of the medications, particular population are even at increased risk for developing type 2 diabetes. So let's talk about it on how those two are related. So talk about how you look at that overall care for the person. Like you said, with the availability of medication now, what has happened is that people are living longer. And because they're living longer, other chronic diseases are setting in as well. And the older you get, the more those risks increases. One other thing is that some of the medication that's used for HIV treatment also increases the risk of acquiring diabetes. We have people like who are in the older class of medication called the protease inhibitors. This part of the medication we use in treating HIV. The older versions, which we find in, the, in some of our older clients, because they've been on this for a long time and it's been working well for them, increases the chance of developing new onset diabetes. You also have those that, and this happened because this particular medication have changes in insulin sensitivity, as well as having issue in blood sugar clearance in the body. You alter the glucose clearance in the body. So you also have the other HIV medication that, disturbs fat distribution in the body, increasing weight gain. Very important why we're treating the HIV also to be monitoring for the onset of diabetes in our patients with HIV who are on treatment. So how often do you screen then when they come in? I know initially when they come in, you of course you screen, but do you do that every three months, every six months? How does that happen? The American Diabetic Association, their recommendation for us is that we screen patients when they're coming first at the time of them starting the HIV medication. We're also going to start screen them also at the time of them switching medication. You also want to screen them also three to six months after starting the medication. Okay. That's good. That's really good. So you have to keep those appointments. So it's not enough to come in, get your refills on your medication, right? So talk about, no for diabetes, the A1C is one of the gold standard tests that we use in diagnosis and also to see long-term management. But talk about some of the challenges with using A1C in persons living with HIV. 
who also might be at risk of diabetes or already have a diagnosis of diabetes. With the hemoglobin A1c, what is understood with it is that currently it underestimates the glucose index or the glycemia in people with HIV, especially those who are setting HIV medication in the class of TIs, medication that we're using in treating the HIV. So for those ones, if they're on the medication, you don't want to be using A1C because what tends to happen is that the A1C tends to give a false value uh, because it masks, that medication masks the amount of glucose they can um, see in the HIV patient. This is because it alters their hemoglobin level in the red blood cells count, giving a false sense of the screening. The recommendation is for you to use the fasting glucose test. This is where the patient has to be fasting for at least eight hours. When they come in, we check their blood sugar. And if the blood sugar is above 126 milligram per DL, and you do it again another day, and it's the same above, then we can confidently tell the person that they have diabetes. Another method you can use for our patient with HIV on this class of medication, even a backup here, also can affect those if you use hemoglobin A1C. We use another test called tosamine, which is and more like in a local, in a small time for, is a something that the combination that forms when glucose interacts with a certain protein in the body. So we're looking at that level as well. That provides accurate diagnosis for this patient with HIV. That's good to know that so people should be aware of that, that are, yes, A1C is what we look at as go, but it has limitations when someone has been diagnosed with HIV. Another thing I really wanted us to talk about then is the care for the person. It's, you know, you're dealing with two different conditions now that involves medications, lifestyle changes. Talk about some of those lifestyle. You mentioned a little bit around nutrition. Now nutrition becomes very important now when you're talking about a person with HIV and diabetes or even at risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So talk about the importance of lifestyle changes and let's start with nutrition being really key in keeping this person healthy. Nutrition is something that is very, very vital in both HIV and diabetes. Now, we'll go back to the AIDS that we talked about at the beginning. One of the classic of AIDS is somebody losing weight, right? So the society sees everyone with HIV is that it has to be skinny yeah. and thin, malnourished and all that. Mm -hmm. However, with HIV infection, like we said, or even with the AIDS, when you become a, stay on medication, you look like every other person who is without HIV, even better, right? Because some of the medication we have in treating HIV now helps in weight gain, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, the education piece of faith with the nutrition comes in where you know that just because the person has HIV doesn't mean they should go and eat every available fatty foods they can find so that they can look healthy, gain weight, and not look skinny. So that would be a misconception. So that's where we now have to get in touch with nutritionists to follow this person on daily to day basis to say, okay, this is how we're gonna do your meal plan. Cut down on the fatty food, the carbohydrate, increase your protein intake. And that also brings us to another risk management exercise. You have to encourage that exercise at least 30 minutes a day, five days a week. So nutrition, exercise, that helps to prevent the acquisition of diabetes or even when you already have the diabetes, that helps to control it while you're also on medication. That is really awesome information. I know I love the fact you said physical activity, nutrition, making sure you're coming in for appointments, right? There is no shame in there. You come in, you have to keep those regular appointments, getting all your lab work done. All those are really key and taking the medications as prescribed. It is very, 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 very important to be doing that. You get situation where patients say, I'm taking my medications every day. I'm which they are. So in their head, they were like, I can't, I don't have to come in. And like, you still have to come in to get those labs done. Because there are some situations where the virus develops resistance 
to the medication. And if we don't do your lab, we wouldn't know. And here you are being consistently taking your medication, not knowing that the medication is no longer working. So that's where we come. You need to come in, we have to check your labs, we want to make sure you're still virologically suppressed, we want to make sure your CD4 cell counts are still elevated, we want to make sure you haven't developed diabetes. And if you have diabetes, we want to make sure that you're well controlled. If we need to make adjustments to your medication, then we'll have to. So it's really, really important that you're keeping your appointment with your provider where you are. I really like that. And you shared so many wonderful information today. And I really wanted to make that connection between HIV and diabetes because it is in our community. We cannot sit and pretend and act like it's them over there. It's something that happens somewhere else. No, it is. And like you mentioned, with medication available, people don't look it. Okay, you cannot make assumption that just because someone looks healthy and is eating all that fatty food look like the symbol of wealth and health doesn't mean that's their HIV status. So let's, I love one of this conversation because I wanted to increase awareness that we need to stop the shaming and stigma that's associated with this, but also recognizing that it is in our community. We have uncles, we have family members, we have friends who are living with this, but we want to make sure that they're getting the right care and we're preventing the spread of the virus in our community. So talk about what are some of the things people can begin to do today so that they increase their awareness and how can this support other people who are living with HIV and diabetes? here in the DMV or anywhere in the world, actually? One of this is try not to be judgmental, right? People living with HIV, not everybody is comfortable sharing their status, right? And this because of the stigma that have come over the years with it. Um, so for if you happen to know someone, someone able to disclose their status to you, or you go to someone, some, your family member, friend, or rich, and you, you happen to see their medication by mistake and happen to know what it is, or you know some people will Google, oh, I don't know this, what is it? I'll find what it is. You should not be quick to judge the person. You should not ostracize the person. You should be compassionate. You should be able to discuss about it. When this, in the world, in current stage where HIV is no longer a death sentence. There's a word we use in Igbo, and you might know this, we call Aurea Ubirinajocha. Translated literally, it means it's a, a disease that ends in the soil or in death per se, but it's no longer what it is now. It's no longer what it is. So when you know someone, loved one, friend, who is HIV, it's about time to begin to talk about the person's feeling. What are they going through? You can even say, tell me more about this. And you will be surprised at what they will tell you. Our patients know because they've been in this for a while, we'll be educating them every day. They're able to educate others about it, those who are comfortable with our judgment. Now we know that if you're undetected, you cannot transmit it. It's simple as that. So letting person, everybody know, aware that undetected, undetectable means on transmission would ease that stigma. It would let people know that it can't get HIV if you just interact with somebody. It can't just, it can't get HIV by having face-to-face -face contact with somebody. You can't get HIV by sharing cup or food. You see somebody, it's like, oh, that person has HIV. I'm not going to eat the food the person cooked. I'm not going to be, no, I'm not going to shake the hand. No, you can't get HIV from that. Just because this person's status shouldn't make you treat them any less a human being. When you didn't know them, you and I, I tell people, in your day-to-day -day interaction with people outside grocery store, you know, restaurants, you've interacted with somebody with HIV, <laughs> but you didn't know, and you were normal. So what is the difference now that you know about somebody with HIV? You shouldn't treat the person any less of a human. Is it the same person? You actually talk to make sure they're on medication. If they're not, encourage them to go see somebody. And as a person too, that also makes you to want to live. Oh, this person, if they didn't tell me, I wouldn't have known because they look healthy as I am. 
that should also prompt you to go get tested. Because I oftentimes I hear people will say, oh no, I'm clean. They use that word, I'm clean. Or uh, they get into a relationship, or like, oh, he looks good, or she looks good. Nah, she doesn't have anything, or he doesn't have anything. You tell your partner, let's go together to go get tested. Sometimes discuss with your partner or your friend, can I go with you to your appointment? That also brings confidence in those living with HIV. That also helps them to say, you know what, people care about me because everybody needs that care and love and understanding. That will help go a long way in reducing the stigma. I love everything you're sharing. And I, I wish I had a loudspeaker. We could put it out there so everybody could hear it. We need to be really showing empathy, especially in our community where we are so quick to judge. And if a partner is telling you, hey, let's go get tested together, it doesn't mean they're out there doing stuff. That's safe. A lot of respect <laughs> for any man who would say, let's go do this. And I wish a lot more people did it in our community rather than just hide and pretend all is well. We always end with some final thoughts and final thing you want to leave our audience with. You shared so many wonderful things and I'm sure our listeners were taking notes. So some final words of things you want to leave our audience with, especially around HIV and now relating it to other chronic conditions like diabetes. Yeah, my, my final words would be testing, testing, testing. Clinics, including the clinics I work for, there are mobile vans, they go on the streets. It doesn't take long to get tested. Of course, safe sex practices. If you know anyone living with the virus, be considerate. Always be supportive, all right? It's not a death sentence. Don't look at them as anything less. I also want to say that at the moment, there is no cure, but there is control. It's something that we haven't discussed, in, especially in our African community. You will have people who say, oh, I went to church, it was cured. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that the spiritual belief is not there. Uh, we'll have to make it as anything less. But right now, what they consider a cure from understanding is when they're undetected, they think they're cured. No, being undetected doesn't mean you should stop taking the medication for those uh, HIV positive. Once your provider tells you undetected, you need to continue taking the medication because once you stop, the numbers are gonna go up. And once the numbers go up, that means you are at risk of transmitting the virus to another person. So my final words is if you're HIV positive, make sure you get on medication as soon as possible. Get protection, use condoms during sexual activity. And for family members who know someone living with HIV and for friends who know someone living with HIV, be supportive as possible and help them through the journey. It's a long journey, right? It's a long journey, but anyone with a virus can live a normal life. Thank you so much. I know we're going to have you come back again on the show. Ike Chuku, I truly appreciate the words of wisdom, all the wonderful information you're sharing today with our listeners. And I am super, super grateful. I know you'll be back. We'll talk more. There are other angles just coming. I'm like, yeah, we, we're going to develop this more and really increase awareness in our community. But most importantly, people should have the right information, the right resources. And I love the fact that it's a, you know, a proud African Igbo man telling people, go get tested, know your status. Uh, it is a really powerful message coming from you. And I know we'll have you come back on the show, talk about some other issues related to men, but I am super, super grateful. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, it's been an honor. I know you've been doing great work in the community. It's funny when I look around, you know, with the DCPCA, there's a, a DC Primary Care Association. I see your handwork all over their educational materials. I'm like, there you go. You know, of course, what you're doing with the diabetes patients, with your company, Sorogy, I think that is amazing. Helping people be on track, you know, taking care of themselves and getting the diabetes controlled. Well, we need more people like you. Thank you for all you do. Keep up the great work. And um, I'm looking forward to coming back on the show again. Awesome. 
Thank you. And to our listeners, we're going to share information on how to reach Ike. We're going to have his contact information in the notes. Share with friends and family. We love hearing from you. Comments, what you like, topics for future shows. And until we meet again, remember your health matters. 